So uh, this is a little different. I think it's a different perspective on, on how to use CXL. Uh, and I'm mostly focused on uh, shared memory, and I'm the FAMFS guy. So I'm going to talk about what that is and why it is and stuff. Um, so uh, first, a little bit about system RAM versus DAX mode, uh, then some my dynamic capacity overview, because I think we're going to have competing ones of those, you know. Um, some FAMFS details and uh, some info about cache coherency. I'm going to try to skip over FAMFS details unless there's a lot of questions about it. Uh, there's quite a bit of detail in the slides, uh, so I encourage people to, to look at those. Um, so kind of a busy slide, but system RAM versus DAX mode. If it's system RAM, you online it. Linux owns it. It's eligible for being given to anybody in response to an allocation. Um, that's got a lot of flexibility. You can migrate pages. You can run auto NUMA. Um, but uh, memory and connectivity failures affect system RAS because you don't know what the kernel put in it. Um, DAX mode, on the other hand, Basically, you have to have apps that know how to use it. Um, but that includes FAMFS, which makes it look like a, a file system. Uh, and when you do it that way, uh, system RAS isn't affected in the same way because, um, because Linux doesn't put anything in the memory. And in fact, not even FAMFS puts anything in the memory from the kernel, except in response to read and write calls or MMAP on behalf of the user process. So the blast radius of a failure of the memory is the process that was access accessing it normally. Um, so a quick overview of DCD, because uh, so one of the things, I'm one of the authors of DCD in the spec. Uh, so I have some perspective on why things were put there. Um, it's seen as something complicated, and I think there's a lot of, there's a certain amount of misconception about it, but a DCD is just a memory device with allocation and access control built in. So when you connect it, there's no memory provided. You have to allocate some. Uh, we need a fabric manager for that. Luckily, Gisela's here. Um, and uh, tagged allocations, so allocations can be tagged or not. If they're shareable, they must be tagged. It's mandatory. And tagged allocations, I claim, are file-like. How is that? Well, there's a tag that you should be able to use to find that memory. And if an orchestrator allocates memory for an application or to back a VM or something, then the orchestrator should provide the tag you know, to the VM or to the code that starts up the VM. Uh, and then that's how you agree on what memory is what. If the memory is shared, that's how we agree what memory we're going to go find. And I'm going to put stuff in it, and you're going to look at it, right? Um, so there, there's some talk about MemFDs and, and whatnot. Um, I'm a little concerned about that. I know DAX devices work here. Um, and I think in MemFDs probably can too. but. This, when we, when we introduce FAMFS, we've got a, uh, an analogy of these character DAX devices to block devices. With block devices, you've got the block ID library and LS block and stuff. And that's a set of tools that you know, looks at all the block devices in a system and looks whether there are recognizable super blocks on them. And whatever devices it finds with super blocks, it tells you what they are. And that includes like logical volumes. Those have super blocks too. Um, and so the, DAX, the character DAX device container is a convenient, convenient thing to have. Um, another thing about tags, the size of a tag is UUID sized. Um, and I claim, fabric manager people, please make them UUIDs. They must be globally unique. There's some ways you can use this when you don't need that. But the, it's broken if broadly we don't make them globally unique. And a tag is actually local to one memory device. So you've got to generate these with the right uh, discipline for UUIDs so that the tag space on one device doesn't collide with the tag space on another device. Um, 
Again, think of them as a, you know, file names, except that they're UUIDs, which are less user friendly, but, um, but unique. Okay, so tags are essential to find the memory that was allocated for some purpose. Um, if the memory is shareable, uh, I claim don't online it as system RAM, that's nonsense. System RAM is going to get zeroed if it was, you were going to share it. Whatever you were going to share was just lost. You basically just can't use shareable memory as tagged capacity unless it's allocated as shareable, but you're, but you're not really going to share it in that case because you can't do that. Um, and then uh, the bullet about FAMFS being able to interleave is slightly out of context here, so I'm going to move on. Um, <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about the core inside of FAMFS. Um, it's been a lot of work over the years. HP's project called The Machine that a lot of people have been aware of if you're old enough. It's maybe 10 years ago. They had resistive RAM, which was persistent and shareable. And, but the, the thinking really was, hey, it's a new paradigm. We need new abstractions. And that never works out very well. Unless you don't want the new stuff adopted, in which case it works out pretty well because um, it's just too hard to use. And so that's, I claim, a bad idea. Now, with um, DAX devices, when, when, when a, a memory device is shared, then there will be a DAX device on one system that references the same memory as a DAX device on another system. If it's tag capacity, I claim, that should be a virtual DAX device that maps to that tagged capacity that also, you know, there's, a, there's one on another system. And you do need a way to resolve tags to those. Um, but uh, once you've got that, that's a thing you can share. An application on one host can mem map it, and on another host you can mem map it, and uh, it's the same memory. But I claim that's still a little bit too hard because apps don't already support DAX devices. A few of them do. But uh, and you can't stat a DAX device to find out what size it is. There's a different procedure for that. So, um, but, so the core insight was this is a little too hard, but all the plumbing we needed to make this look just like a file system is already there, except for the, what turns out to be a little less than 1,000 lines of code currently in the kernel for FAMFS. This is patch sets. It's not upstream yet. And... Uh, so I implemented it. And uh, uh, there are quite a few universities and companies that are kicking the tires of shared memory using this. And uh, uh, it's fairly far along. Um, this, I think I'm not going to dig into because it's too much detail. But I, rec I encourage people to look at the slides and to reach out if you want to talk about the details. Um, but FAMFS is basically a, an append-only log-structured file system. It solves the problem of uh, being able to mount from the same memory, which is analogous to mounting from the same storage device, except it's not a storage device, it's memory. Um, and it handles that by there's a master node that gets to append the log, the metadata log. Client nodes just get to play the log, which means they don't get to create files, but they can see all the files. And any given file, if you choose to make it writable by everybody, you can. Because everybody's mmap is really just going to the memory. Um, you can also, this is a thing I added into the CXL spec, uh, a given host can have a read-only mapping of a CXL device or of a tagged capacity allocation. And in that case, you can actually cause, you know, require the device to drop writes from a host that's not allowed to write. Um, so a little bit about the metadata format, and there's some updates to this, uh, including an interleaved format. One of the things you would want to do with, um, with memory on, or with data on, on uh, fabric attached memory, is you would want to interleave across devices um, for performance. And so we actually support that now. It's not pushed to the mainline repo, but it's, it's going to be there. Um, 
And this is an interesting enablement because CXL uh, hardware, the hardware can be programmed to interleave across devices, and therefore it can be programmed to interleave across tagged capacity instances. But the extent list has to be identical on all the devices or you can't do it. So if it's one extent, it's got to be the same DPA on all the devices or hardware can interleave it for you. But if you're already doing a file system, interleaving is actually straightforward. It's just an interleaved uh, extent list. So uh, my suspicion is that the, the ask of fabric managers allocating, give, you know, give me 32 gigabytes each from these eight devices and make sure it's exactly the same DPA extent list, uh, that's going to be hard. Um, quick status update. Uh, I introduced FAMFS at Plumbers last year. Uh, it wasn't out yet. Um, it's on GitHub. The, RF, the V1 RFC came out in February. Uh, V2 came out in April. Uh, I led a talk on it at uh, LSFMM. And the net of that, um, which wasn't my goal, but it's actually good news in the big picture, is that uh, there's a desire to merge this capability into Fuse. And so I'm working on that. Uh, we have a, uh, Miklos, the maintainers, coming in tomorrow for a, a meetup. And so why is that possible? Well, FAMFS, it's about 1,000 lines of kernel, kernel code and about 6,500 lines of user space code today. And the user space code writes super blocks, initializes the log. All log entries are created by user space code. All log plays are handled by user space code. Um, with the current implementation, when the log gets played for each file, the file gets created. Briefly, it's kind of an empty RAMFS file. And then an ioctl on the file gets called that says, here's your extent list, at which point it's got what it needs to handle mapping faults and handle read-write. Uh, the Fuse implementation changes around a little bit how that works. Um, Fuse has the concept of caching up metadata and you know, timing it out and whatnot. Um, but the key thing that has to be added to Fuse, and Miklos is on board with this, is that uh, a file whose metadata isn't timed out must have its metadata fully cached in the kernel. Because we're enabling memory. It's got to be at memory speeds. Um, and that's what's required for that. Because what does the file system do a million times a second? It answers the question from but down below. Tell me where the data is for this offset in this file. And the answer is in the form of, it's at this offset on this DAX device. Um, and so that's got to be fast. That's why we cache the metadata in the kernel. And that's why we'll have to keep doing that. Um, so uh, interesting use cases. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm, I'm close, but I'm good. So there's a ton of uses of data frames. Um, Apache Arrow is among my favorites uh, because it's a memory-friendly format. It was created by the data analytics community in conjunction with the GPU people to say, you know, don't make me restart my job from the CSV data that I imported or the log that I scraped to get this into memory. Uh, let's build a canonical format where you know, a column of eight byte floats is packed in memory, vectorized, and so on. And so these formats are already super friendly to uh, memory mapping. And in fact, they're made to be stored in files and memory mapped. It's just that until this, files are demand-paged things. Um, in this case, if you dump it into FAMFS for analysis, you, um, you know, it's just memory. There's not a storage backing. Um, In-memory database is also interesting um, because those are also tend to be memory mapped uh, formats. And um, let's see. So yeah, FAMFS doesn't create any new cache coherency problems. It just makes the old ones worse. <laughs> Um, this was a benchmark we showed at uh, FMS. Um, and the purple line is uh, RocksDB database in DRAM. 
and the x-axis is normalized to system memory size. So when we run RocksDB query workloads against a database that's fully cached up in memory, it's fast, right? And when it gets bigger than memory, it gets bad slow, and the P99 latency, the lower plot, goes through the roof, and the lower plot is uh, log scale. Um, this particular uh, diagram, you know, acknowledges maybe more pointedly than uh, will be applicable. That, okay, the CXL memory is a little slower than the regular memory, but you can have a lot of it. And if you have a lot of it and put something big in it, you can have consistent performance uh, scaling all the way to the size of that memory. Uh, this particular uh, data was uh, uh, typical DRAM bandwidth, and it was two CXL cards striped. Uh, with more, we expect to be able to move the green line up towards the purple line on the left side. Um, so, and I think the thinking that I want to encourage is that CXL memory can change, it can change what size of problems fit in memory. And there's a set of techniques we use to make things fit in memory. Um, like sharding, which leads you to shuffling. And not all problems shard well. Some problems have to be shuffled because you've got to move the data to where the compute's available towards the end of the job and whatnot. Shuffling can be an n squared order for n nodes. Um, some problems are hard to shard. But if you, you know, I mean, thought experiment, take four servers, eight terabytes of memory total. You can put two terabytes in each server and take a six, database, a six terabyte database and shard it across the four servers. If sharding works well for you and shuffling's not a problem, that's pretty good. Another way to use the same resources is uh, a quarter terabyte of memory in each server, seven terabytes of shared memory, FAMFS. You could do it with DAX too if you like pain. <laughs> and um, now the whole thing's in memory. All the servers can access all of it. Yeah, the memory's a little bit slower, but there is no shuffling. And um, so these change what fits in memory types of things are, uh, are interesting. A um, Couple words about cache coherency, and that one minute ought to be enough for cache coherency, right? <laughs> um, so CXL has a cache coherent mode, um, but if that sounds to you like it solves all your cache coherency problems, then you probably don't know enough about cache coherency. Um, there are some implications like memory barriers need to wait for all CL flushes that have been called to complete before they unblock and things like that. But um, John's opinion is that uh, shared memory is interesting for the use cases and there are a lot of them where uh, data gets dumped into a shared store, consumed, the outputs go to separate files or data sets, um, and there's a ton of data like that. And you know, like RocksDB is a good example because it writes files out and then they're read-only for the rest of their life, so it maps beautifully onto this. Um, and here's just a, and this is the last slide. Uh, there's a, ton, there's a big ecosystem of stuff that uses data frames, also LSM kind of key value store stuff that is biased towards data that gets written once or not very often and then consumed. And so there you go. Okay, I've got one question for you. Yes. What, is there anything you'd particularly like help with or people to look at? Um, basically, what would you like the people in this room to do oh. to get this there faster? So, that's a great question. Um, the, I'm at a sort of scalability bottleneck point right now because the Fuse port mm -hmm. is gnarly. Uh, and I didn't know enough about Fuse going in, so I'm, I'm just coming up to speed. I expect to be posting Fuse patches 
later this year. Um, the, the big thing that I could use, number one, if you have a use case that you want to play with this for, please do. Number two, I didn't talk about the limitations, but the limitations are kind of epic at the moment. Files are strictly pre-allocated. So you can't change the size of a file once you've allocated it. And you can't just open a file and start writing to it. You know, you can DD in and out of files, but you have to conv equals no trunk. <laughs> um, and today I don't support delete. Now, delete's actually pretty easy to support, but once we do delete, there's a problem. I mean, the, the core problem with FAMFS is that uh, clients may not be up to date playing the log. So if I let you delete a file and then create another file that uses the same memory, some client that's stale still sees an old file that points to the same memory. And so I want feedback about, I mean, my opinion is that it does not make sense to try to turn this into a general purpose file system. Um, that although there are some cases where you might want to use XFS and FS DAX mode on your CXL tagged capacity or CXL memory, if you want to have a file oriented allocator that you don't need to share. If you need to share it, you can't do XFS because it does write back metadata and that's not shareable. Hannes. Can we, sorry, before we go to Hannes, we've got, uh, Garun's got hand up online. Uh, do you want to ask a question, Garun? Yeah, yeah, my question, thank, thank you. you. Uh, how, uh, uh, how do you deal with the memory tearing? I mean, uh, if you, if the FAM uh, FS backended, uh, 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 CTIL may have the theory, some faster, some close, some remote. So what do you uh, move the ma uh, metadata from, uh, fr uh, from one set to another set? Got it. Uh, today, FAMFS doesn't do anything about tiering. It does do striping across multiple memories. And, and actually, the thing that it does today um, because we don't have DCDs yet and we don't have really fabric. But what we've got is some early switches that are, you know, super experimental and whatnot. But what they do is give you one DAX device that is a concatenation of some backend DAX devices. Not striped, concatenated. And that's the worst possible case because uh, a given naive allocation is going to only land on one device. Therefore, FAMFS has a striped allocation mechanism that can be just bucketized based on the knowledge of how big the backend devices are, and it can stripe. Now, later, we could do, uh, you know, more complex tiering. Um, but the problem is, relocation's a problem. It's the same problem that delete is, which is that, you know, we've, we've elegantly solved the problem that clients might have a stale view of metadata, by making that just not matter. The moment you do delete or the moment you relocate something, then it does matter. Deleting, relocating, those aren't hard, but we have to have an understanding with, you know, the application has to understand what its responsibility is or else it breaks. But, uh, and so a, a dialogue about what, how it should go forward in terms of flexibility for delete and whatnot would be very helpful. And then um, because of the fuse port, I don't have, well, there, there's actually one or two issues up on the GitHub that say help wanted, but they're kind of DevOpsy things. But help is definitely wanted. And long term, you know, there is a community starting. There are PRs that have been merged from outside, and more would be great. Um, and yeah. feel free to reach out to me. Oh, right, yeah. Feel free, free okay. to reach out to me. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, right. we can do it afterwards. Can okay. I do the slides? Wait. Oh, that's fine. Hey, wait a sec, he's asking. Have you got a question, Hannes? Go, go yeah, ahead. We can do it. Oh, okay, do it offline. 